Today's guest on The Roost is a very accomplished touring and session keyboard player. He's one of Nashville's go-to guys for keys, so it was a big honor to get to sit down and talk with him. I got to meet him after playing the open jam at the Bourbon Boogie, and I could tell right away he was a very down-to-earth guy. Uh, He's played with artists like Grace Bowers and Devin Gaffillion and so many more. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Josh Blaylock. My first Broadway gig today. Nice. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Where at? Uh, second fiddle rooftop. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just mechanical. Um, so I've just been doing homework for the past <laughs> month and a half. And sure. Getting ready. Uh, you ever played on Broadway? Not, not like that. Mm-hmm. I uh, the band I toured in uh, when I first when I like started. We had a residency at Acme, mm. um, but we would just play like once a month on like a Friday night or a Saturday night. I think there was a year where we, well, I think we did it for three years. There was one year where it was all Friday, and another year where it was all Saturday, mm. and then it went back to being Friday. Uh, but it was always like once say like once a month but it was like separated enough that we had a lot of touring in between everything yeah um, but outside of that nothing downtown consistency mm. uh i've also kind of i grew up here so i've always oh, avoided wow. it <laughs> oh yeah I hear i've you. had a lot of friends that i mean i feel like the only way i've seen people make a living doing it is they were doing like multiple shifts a day for sure almost every day yeah a week or something which makes me feel like I would start hating certain songs if they get covered too much. Oh, 100%. You know? 100%. It would, take, it would take the soul out of, like, songs that I actually like. I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to play this song again. Yeah. You know, especially in that environment where it's, like, it's very iffy if if the people are genuinely into it or if they're just in a place where they're like, oh, there's buzz and there's alcohol and we're, we're just partying and yeah. there just happens to be music in the background. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's also a concern is like um, just being in that environment, like being in the bar so much, like I'm really going to have, I mean, I've never been a big drinker, but oh, really yeah. ha- really having to like keep that under wraps. But like, sure. uh, yeah, I'm hoping it's just, a, it's just a stepping stone right now yeah. just to, so I can stick around in town. And, until, yeah. until and it's I, not to say that it can't be, because I've definitely seen it be that for a lot of friends of mine where they we're like playing tin roof a lot. And then they Mm -hmm. finally get like that, that touring gig that gets them off of Broadway. Mm -hmm. Um, and they can play the music that they actually want to play. And it keeps them from having to do that when they, or when they, when they're back off the road, they can like be a little more choosy and like do the stuff that they actually genuinely do have fun doing. If it's downtown. Yeah. You know, being able to have a balance is what we all work towards. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's the dream. Yeah. So what was it like growing up in, like, what part of town were you kind of uh, at? I grew up in East Nashville. Oh, wow. Uh, my parents are still in East Nashville. Um, but I grew up right by Shelby Park, kind of that area, that Inglewood wow. area. Like, kind of walking distance from Shelby Bottoms. Hmm. Um, so it was nice kind of being kind of around an area that was very, very peaceful. Hasn't changed too much because I've, having been here as long as I have, I've watched a lot of areas change very drastically. Yeah. I mean, there's parts of East Nashville that have changed pretty drastically, but my neighborhood, I would say, is still recognizable and still feels the yeah. same. It still feels homey. That's good. Um, I'm in North Nashville now. I've been in my grandparents' old house since 2014. Nice. Um, I was at Belmont mm. five years uh, between 09 and 14, and mm. I graduated August of, two, of 2014, but I moved into that house after I was done with classes in the spring. Yeah. So I've, yeah, um, watched a lot and I'm kind of close to Germantown. And that was like one of the first real areas I got to watch, have a whole facelift from gentrification. Oh, wow. Germantown was like all of those like really nice 
high rise apartments that are like brick. Mm. Those like brick warehouse type apartments were all just empty. Mm. Um, and so it was wild to watch over just the last few years, especially even before COVID, like how Germantown just became this really nice spot with like, they used to have a venue that was behind Fifth and Taylor. That restaurant Fifth and Taylor is still there, but there used to be a venue that was pretty cool behind it. And then all these really awesome restaurants started popping yeah. up and I love it over there. It's, it's great. It's like very walkable, mm. a lot of nice cafes and nice. stuff like that. Nice. But you were playing with some groups in Belmont or? Yeah. Uh, I guess you've been playing with, you've been playing with groups your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of wild. Uh, it's, it's, it's so cool to look back at like all the people that were at Belmont while I was there. Like Coin was getting their start. Oh wow! When I was there, I remember being at one of their sessions because they recorded some of their early stuff on campus, like on the studios on campus. Um, there was a band that I looked up to that was there. Uh, they were older than me, um, called the Delta Saints. They were really cool. They were like one of the first bands I got to watch, like graduate and then tour Europe. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's cool. Oh. That that's attainable you know yeah. um and then yeah judah and the lion we were all the same year judah played on the baseball team mm. we played a lot of bas- like pickup basketball together mm. so it's been cool watching those guys become rock stars <laughs> um i was in a band called dynamo huh. so we were like in the snarky puppy world for a yeah. long time so we toured like straight out of college like because we did our first album as a part of one of the guys in the band's grad r- recital recordings because you could do like a, a grad recital as well as like your junior and senior recital. But he also did, um, instead of a recital, he did a recording. And then his, um, what was it? You have to, you have to write your, uh, what is it called? Uh, it's like your final, like your. Yeah, your. Oh, your, your uh, thesis. Your thesis, right. His thesis was based on, on everything that went into recording that album um and the three albums that we did in that band were like similar to the like, the live act uh, albums that snarky did where we mm-hmm. had you know people sitting in a room with headphones oh, on yeah. and all that stuff so we did the first one as part of his thesis at ocean way studios because we had oh, a lot nice. of friends that were in the engineering program at belmont that kind of either interned at ocean way or mm-hmm. eventually got jobs at ocean yeah. way <clears throat> um and then we did our second one at Sound Emporium, um, and then our third one in Syracuse, New York, because True. we had a lot of, a lot of friends uh, in upstate New York. One of our drummers was from Syracuse too. That's sick. So we would play up there quite a lot. That's sick. But, yeah. So yeah, what was it like touring right out of college? Like you, you were probably like twenty two, something like that. And yeah. where were y'all touring? Where were y'all kind of? A lot of it was the Northeast. It worked that it was like kind of half and half of the band was between undergrads and masters. Mm. So touring, I would say, was pretty interesting in the fact that uh, a lot of it was entangled with clinics, which Mm. I still, to this day, miss doing. Uh, We would go to a lot of the guys' old undergrad um, Mm. and old high schools that they went to that had good music programs, and we would do something like at one of those schools like during the day and then we would play a show that night and if they were old enough to be able to be at both they would come to both we would bring merch to the clinics um and it it just felt so good to be able to give back and not be you know that that much older than the people we were talking to you know it was cool to be able to show like hey we're we all just graduated and we're making it work yeah you know and that was always really a lot really fun to be able to do that and do it pretty consistently like we we would either go to different high schools we hadn't been to before but then sometimes we would go revisit and see how students were doing Mm. or like we would see students like take that next step and we would randomly see some of the same students at a a college in the same city or something like that yeah um so are these clinics they're kind of like business oriented uh they were more like performance Mm. q a based sometimes we would like if they had a jazz program we would we would perform and then in between songs they would ask us questions mm-hmm. about arrangements or improv or yeah. whatever and then they would set up like their big band would set up and we would spread out through 
different sections of the big band since there were so many of us. Yeah. And um, and we, we almost had like two of every instrument. Like there was me on keys, another guy on keys, Ryan, um, Kevin on sax, Andrew on trumpet, Zach on bass, um, Adam on guitar, Hank on guitar, John on guitar, uh, Nate and Ross on drums. So we had a lot of people and a singer, Dane. Um, but I actually went to school for trombone. So even when we would spread out through like a jazz band, oh, I wow. would sit with the trombone section oh, wow. and Ryan would work with like the rhythm section and the piano player that was comping or whatever. And it was cool. We had enough pieces to be able to work with everyone all at once and then kind of help with, um, you know, helping kids build their confidence within improv because it's, it's a lot harder to really work yourself into if you're not already confident in that realm like just being able to like be called out to like all right play something and make yeah. something up and know that it's okay that if you mess up it's fine yeah you know like getting that concept of there are no wrong notes right in your head yeah um and not being too reliant on theory and being like yeah you learn all the rules so you can break them kind of thing you know yeah um so that was a lot of fun and it was cool to be able to work with different age groups and traveling the country and seeing the different levels of money set aside for music education. Oh, yeah. Because That's I grew up, point. having grown up here, I went to a music high school that I auditioned for. And to this day, I still regret the fact that we never got to go back and work with those students and oh, work wow. with my band director before he passed away last year. Oh. And um, But he retired, I want to say six or seven years ago. But okay. he was an incredible saxophonist who could also sing. He was in like the BB King All-Stars band. He was, wow. Uh, he was also a military guy, so he was in like the, I want to say the Navy jazz band or something like that. Whenever he would have a sub, it was because he had a gig. Wow. It wasn't because he couldn't come in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, but I always regretted never being able to like come back to my high school and, and do the same things we did for so many others. Um, mm. With it being in at home. you know. Mm. But it was so much fun to be able to, to travel and to look forward to not only the shows, but to be able to look forward to doing that too. A lot of the guys' parents were also teachers. My, my mom was a teacher too, but not mm. a music teacher. Um, Your parents play music? They played. My mom played clarinet. Mm. My dad played cello, which is still <laughs> wild to me because my my mom is a, uh, she's a language arts, English reading teacher. Mm. Uh, and my dad works in like installation, like uh, doors and windows and locks, mm. like, like he started out as a locksmith, but he's an incredible, like, I feel, I feel like he has a very good, like, engineer mind, mm. but it, it always is, he also power lifted when I was little, oh, so word. he's just like a big guy that looks like he played football, <laughs> yeah. and so, like, when, when I found out he played cello, it's just, that was always <laughs> one of those things where I was like, I can't see you doing that, but I, growing up, they had me listening to a lot of good music, and I was grateful, the older I got, the more grateful I became of being allowed to listen to whatever I wanted to listen to. Cause I've met so many friends, especially in college that yeah. were like very sheltered in that way. where like, they could only listen to certain things. Mm. And I was like, all the shows I went to prior to college were metal shows. <laughs> I was like, at least I was allowed to do that. Even yeah. if they didn't like, like that music or listen to it, it was like cool that I could still go. And I was with friends and I was in a safe space and mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't, I don't really see too many people that grew up here, but mm -hmm. that must be interesting to like go to shows like before you can even drink or anything like that. And like, what's that environment like? That's got to be, yeah, you know, pretty pretty awesome. Be so exposed at such a young age to some crazy stuff like that. Yeah, it was a very inspiring environment, and it's cool to to still be here and still see friends that I <laughs> grew up going to metal shows with <laughs> as adults now. Yeah, and I'm like. You know, we're not all pitting anymore, or like, you know, running around and doing as much like the crazy things we were doing in our 20s or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, as teenagers or whatever. But yeah. we'll still like go to the shows. Some of those bands we used to go see are like coming out of retirement to do like mm -hmm. shows just to come back and because they miss it and we miss seeing them. Um, and because some of them like still still live here. But, you know, it's it's so. Like cool to be able to say that you grow up here and you get to like kind of get a sneak peek at what the scene is before you've even considered 
what it's like to be a part of it. You get yeah. to just see like different aspects of it. And like people who aren't that much older than you kind of like doing a thing that makes them happy and being like, oh yeah, like I like music. I want to do that. And it clearly it makes them happy. Like I'm yeah. sure it's stressful and I'm sure it's a lot of work to maintain that kind of a career. Yeah. But it was also cool to be able to like grow up in an environment where like everyone's taking the same risk because they believe in it and there's enough opportunity to go around. You know, yeah. I've always said, especially in my travels, I would put this community up against most oh, because yeah. it's such a family oriented, like everybody supports. If you're a good person, like at the end of the day, you're going to be fine. Like good things happen to good people. Even if you're not the best at whatever instrument it is, there's still a door that's open and there's still a path you can go on and there's still a room for you to do whatever you want to do, no matter what the, whatever that is, whatever genre that want, you wanted to be like, like it's always funny to hear people moving to Nashville, move to Nashville and they say, well, I'm like, Oh, I guess I have to do country. I'm like, you don't have to. Yeah. Like I've only done a handful of things and all of those things were things that I intentionally said yes to. Mm. Like I didn't right. go into that world wanting to be in it. Like, yeah, it was always funny. Like just, Traveling as a kid, people find out you're from Nashville. I'm like, oh, do you listen to this? You listen to this? I'm like, no. Yeah. There's so much other stuff happening <laughs> in wow. this city that, you know, you can listen to or you can be around or you can be inspired by. And yeah. So it's been cool to like grow up in an environment that's very, very inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Like uh, East Nashville and even uh, even last night i was at the the basement and just seeing like some some rock and some real like punk ass shit and it's mm -hmm. like oh dude like it's uh it's great because not only is there just like a huge infrastructure for country music it's just infrastructure for all kinds of music and like yeah. uh back where i'm from in louisiana like lafayette louisiana has a big pretty big metal scene and like uh you know it it would be kind of a shame to just like like leave that part of who I am out to come out here and, and try and do this thing just because there's more opportunity out here. So it's, yeah. it's refreshing to see that there's still a scene of people doing what's meaningful to them, even if it's not like the big hot thing. Yeah. But like, yeah, man. So like, I guess I could kind of, I could kind of see you being a headbanger, dude. Cause, <laughs> cause uh, man, when I was watching you at, at Flamingo, it, and I just to talk about Flamingo for a little bit, it was like, man whenever you're in the house band and i'm watching y'all and like it's almost like everyone's just like seeing who can raise the energy bar a little bit higher yeah. and I, I see you like stand up and just start pitch bending your king Korg, <laughs> and i'm like oh snap like he's taking it higher bro it's, <laughs> it's like yeah. bro it's like it got me hyped up man you get me hyped up uh every time i see you man so that's so sick and Thank it's you. like i guess i can connect the dots on you you were probably head banging oh, for yeah. sure for sure. I had a lot of friends in like high school that were in metal bands and it gave me just the, uh, such a joy just to be able to check the mic before they're set. Mm -hmm. Just to like go up and <laughs> <laughs> and then just give the, the actual screamer the mic. I'm like, all right, that was like my two seconds. Of fame. That's, all I, that's all I wanted. And then discovering bands like, you know, Born of Osiris or Devil Wears Prada and being like, oh, they have a keyboard player. That's sick. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know we belonged in this genre. Oh, wow. Thanks to MySpace, I was like discovering all sorts of stuff just by listening to a band and their friends and their friends and then the, the hole just got deeper and yeah, deeper yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh. yeah yeah that was kind of like spotify for me like once i got a car and that was kind of the same time i got spotify and like okay i can now listen to whatever i want and they have the like fans also like feature mm -hmm. and just rabbit holing on you know on music it's crazy it's like you know i, I never grew up with like you know, vinyls or I had some CDs mm -hmm. growing up when I was growing up, but like, you know, I was born in 2000. So like I pretty much always had the internet or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's just, it's just weird and, and different, but, uh, I don't know, like lately I really haven't been listening to that much music. It's kind of sad. It's like, uh, it's like, you know, is what it is, but, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm, you got to take a break. Yeah. There's, there's so much coming out all at once yeah. too, that it's really hard to keep up with stuff. I didn't even get a streaming subscription until within the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I have Tidal, 
Wow. And which is also because when you when you unpack that, that means I was paying for music up until <laughs> two years ago. Because I was I, I still have like an iPod that I've had for a long time. Sick. And the only way it would charge was based on my old laptop. Mm. And but I would still go on that laptop and buy an album that came out mm. and then add it to my iPod and then I would drive around with that. Mm. You know, I wasn't I didn't have the capability of driving around with stuff on my phone unless it was on like YouTube or something. Yeah. But I wasn't even using YouTube the same way mm-hmm. back then. Yeah. Um and I didn't have like Bluetooth capability until like I recently bought something that you can plug into my um aux. Yeah. And then it plays through, you know, the mm-hmm. um aux cable yeah. slot or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. That's crazy. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think the moment it really hit me was when Kendrick's newest album came out mm. and I got the notification that it was like, oh, you can listen to it. And I was like, oh, I guess I don't have to go <laughs> buy it. I, I already have listen it. listen to it. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's like the two sided like mm-hmm, right. blade of like, yeah. I'm paying for the subscription. So that's kind of like that. But then, and then the streams is like paying Kendrick, I guess. Yeah. But then it's it's so weird that I'm like, I'm still the person that will go to a show and like I'll support by buying something, especially yeah. if it's an artist that I really support. I'll yeah. buy a vinyl or I'll buy a shirt or something to make sure that I know that they're getting my money. Like actually, because yeah. you don't, you never know if like just listening to stuff is gonna get where it needs to go. <laughs> yeah, especially small, smaller people. Yeah, that's crazy, yeah. man. And with how things have changed over the years, with um, the percentages just dropping. Yeah, and them not really caring as much about the the lesser artists that are still really good yeah. but they're just not making the same amount or not getting the same level of streams yeah. or whatever it's like it's sad now i think i know the answer to this because you just got a streaming subscription two years ago but <laughs> are you on tiktok at all uh i am but mm. i mainly use it f- for like comedy like yeah, the right. most most of my stuff that pops up on TikTok is like, s- like, oh yeah, stand up, stand up, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've discovered so many new comedians mm. on on TikTok. Yeah, which I love that stuff. And then like random nerdy stuff, like anime breakdowns or stuff about Marvel or Star Wars or stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, oh, that's yeah. all I need. I don't need any yeah. other. And then if I discover music through it, fine. Like I'll see yeah. like those random clips of like those incredible beatboxers mm-hmm. that just use an SM7 yeah. and they'll just like oh, yeah. sing and they'll put effects on it and stuff. I'm yeah. like, yo, this is crazy. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of shit is cool, but yeah, dude. I don't post a whole lot. I think the last time I posted, um, me and my brother, Zachariah, who you may have seen play at Flamingo, it's a bass player. Yeah, it sounds super familiar. We've been playing music together for going on 15 years now, like since freshman year of college. Wow. And during COVID, we started a production duo called Black Lock. And so some of the stuff like further in, because we would post a video of like a beat we made every Friday and then people could take the bounce of what we dropped um, oh, yeah. out of the bio and mm. then do a, a verse chorus and then post it, and then we would pick our favorite. Sick. And then they could win the beat, and then we could either finish it together or they could produce it or whatever. Um, and then the further in we got, um, we started doing just like higher quality videos, and we started posting some of those on on TikTok. And then there'd be like certain weeks where like either he would be the feature uh, featured producer and like he would produce the whole thing, and then he would share it on both Blacklock and on his own personal IG, and I would do the same thing. Um, and then I started moving some of that stuff over to TikTok and just, and I guess that was kind of the start of like figuring out the differences between the different algorithms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, all right, so I have to post it this time on Instagram because people are on their phones this morning and they're not at work yet. Yeah. And then TikTok is just like its own anomaly where I'm like, yeah. all right, hopefully yeah. people see this, but I have to put all these different hashtags so that it pops up. I'm like, God, yeah, this yeah, is too yeah. much work. I don't, I'm like, the more you have to do research, the more you just don't care. Right. <laughs> yeah, know? man. It's super hard for me to get motivated about like a bunch of content creation like that. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not a big TikTok guy, but 
I do watch a shit ton of comedy, bro. I love yeah. comedy on there. But I didn't know if you saw about like the Universal Music Group pulling the music off TikTok. Yeah. I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Because it's, it's I'm, interesting how like the industry is changing on one hand, but it's also like you don't have to just let things happen a certain way. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting, I guess, being involved with different artists who've had their music taken off. Mm. I think that sucks. Yeah. And I have my own, I guess, feelings towards people in the industry, I think, it, that is very jaded in the sense that, like, anytime I have to be a part of a show mm. that is in front of the industry, mm-hmm. I feel like there is a part of myself that inherently just, like, turns off mm. where I feel like I have to... I don't like feeling like I have to impress people that don't do half of the same work or understand any of what I'm bringing to the table. Like, right. It, it's so hard to play a show in front of people that have so much control over the industry that you're in, but they don't like have any kind of musical. And I'm not saying that all of them don't, right. but there are a lot of them that don't have any kind of musical background. They just say that they know what a hit sounds like, or they just know what good music sounds like. And I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. but music is, relative like it's, yeah. it's supposed to be able to be if someone likes this thing and you don't that doesn't mean that they're dumb or like yeah. they don't like good music it just means that you don't like this music and they like this music like it's so weird to play music in front of people like that and mm-hmm. then like you get these compliments it's like oh god you sound so good. i'm like <laughs> you don't understand how many years and mm-hmm. and how much time is put into making this product that you mm-hmm. help put out there i guess yeah. in some ways right you don't understand how much work goes into that. And I don't feel like I have to like tap dance in front of you to impress you to, to show you like, this is what it sounds like live versus this is what it sounds like recorded. Cause mm-hmm. I'm on both of those things, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know? So like, of course I'm not going to play it things exactly like the record. If I have the, the link, the, the, the ability. And if the artist is like, we can record it like this, but you know, this, this gig can, we can still have the freedom and the flex the flexibility to, kind of bring ourselves to the table, which are my ideal gigs where I get to be myself. I don't feel like I'm put into a box and mm-hmm. like I have to play things note for note or whatever. Yeah. Um. But it's, it's so bizarre when you have to like think about how much control these like label people have and industry yeah. people have. And I'm like, you aren't even putting the same work into the product that you have so much control over. Yeah. You just are giving people money to like live this dream out in some ways, like it, depending on what angle we're looking at it and in, in, in regard to the industry. Yeah. And it just, it feels so weird to like, it, it sucks. Like when, yeah. when, when industry people, like, I guess the whole, I guess going back to the TikTok thing, it sucks that they have the control to like ruin people's careers at that point. Like, yeah. because people have built careers yeah. within a platform. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are wrong with TikTok yeah. that aren't even music related right. that should be like controlled and managed a lot better. Mm. But like, from a musical standpoint, I think it is pretty sad that like artists have to like, that have built such a, mm-hmm. a platform on such, yeah, on, on it. Yeah. Especially if that's like, where they were doing their work. Yeah. Have to like start over. Mm hmm. And because everything has its own algorithm, yeah. like TikTok, TikTok has its own algorithm, IG has an algorithm, YouTube has a wild, mm-hmm. really weird algorithm mm-hmm. to the point where you still have to do like the things you would do 10 years ago, which is like you have to share YouTube videos and mm-hmm. make sure people see those. Like mm-hmm. there's, I don't think YouTube videos don't just like pop up yeah. in the same way that like advertisements pop up on like TikTok or YouTube or Instagram and stuff like yeah. that, you know? So yeah. it's... Yeah, it's sad that the control isn't in the hands of the people who are yeah. providing the art. Yeah, they had no choice. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sad when yeah. you have like conversations about stuff like this and there's no like right or wrong answer to like this is how this could be fixed. Yeah. You know, because it's no recourse. Yeah. And even if we do have the answer we don't have the power to like, you know, really be like, hey, I think you guys should do this. And then that would help everyone. Yeah. You know, it has been cool. I don't know if you've seen what James Blake has mm-hmm. done where he kind of created his own 
I guess, kind of streaming platform, mm. but you can put like unreleased songs on it. Nice. And then people can comment on those songs in the same way they would comment on something on like either TikTok or Instagram. Mm. They can like click on a song and then write something under it. Um, I wish I could explain it better. I've only yeah. seen like little clips of what it does. Almost like a band campy kind of thing or like kind of almost like a SoundCloud, but like your own personal yeah. website kind of version of that. That's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see how how people are going to get creative and get out of out of this kind of like rut of the typical TikTok content creation like thing we're going down because it's like we don't really I mean we own our content but we don't really own the the revenue or any of the the back end that we're actually putting out all of this you know yeah all of this literal content and view time out for it's kind of weird mm-hmm. but yeah, that's interesting, man. Yeah. So, but anyway, man, I I appreciate you you coming. I know you're a busy guy. What's uh What's kind of been exci- exciting you right now? Well, this year, I've enjoyed a lot because a lot of the things I have going on are very spaced out. Mm. Um, between the two artists that I've been playing with lately, um, between Grace Bowers, mm-hmm. an incredible seventeen year old guitarist, yeah, uh, and Devin Gofillion. I'm mm. still I've been with him for the last almost three years now. Um, they both just have like festivals throughout the year mm-hmm. and it's nice that they don't really overlap. There's only one festival that they're both doing and they're not even playing the same day. Nice. Um, so it works Sweet. out that I could just hang that whole weekend. Nice. Um, and then I got, I got married last year. Oh, congratulations. Last March. Um, and Sarah's from, she's from Denmark. So oh, wow. we got married when she got her green card a few weeks ago which has been huge because a lot you know built into that and once all of that was kind of settled it it kind of opened the world back up a little bit where we could like oh now we can go back and visit family and i know she's gonna go uh for a lot of the summer and i'm gonna go for like june i've been keeping june as sparse as it is Hmm. so i can go for like three and a half weeks because it's such a nice change of pace being over there let alone just somewhere else, but being in Europe for like a good amount of time is has become such a nice like reset uh, over the past few years. Mm. Um, so it's been nice to have the space to look forward to things outside of music, mm. um, the, the the travel, like us just being able to get away for a weekend yeah. or something, and being able to have the the life in between. Every all the craziness, you know, that's mm-hmm. been something I've been trying to, I've been working towards coming out of COVID. I feel like COVID gave me the time to really re reanalyze and reprioritize things, um, and I feel like it did that for a lot of people. Mm, um, yeah, being able to like not regret or take advantage of the fact that this career is amazing and we yeah. get to do the thing that we love, mm-hmm. but also being able to like not feel bad when you can take a <laughs> a little step away from it yeah and take a break because I'm, I'm I, I love music and I've been playing piano since I was three mm. but I also love playing video games and watching cartoons and playing sports I have a basketball goal in my backyard and nice when the weather's nice sometimes I'll go out there and do that and um yeah just like I've definitely been prioritizing things a lot differently in the last like few years and the balance between like being on the road and being home and just doing things I love doing at home. Like I like playing jams like Flamingo and East mm-hmm. Side Jam and I like doing session work and I, I do a lot of production from my house and I go to work with other producers as well. And I really missed being able to have the two halves of that coin. Like for so long I was just touring mm-hmm. and I'm, I had to be more intentional about like just letting people know that I was back because I was really good at like oh, getting yeah. back home and being like, if you see me, that's how you know I'm back <laughs> 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 because I'm just going to be at home. Yeah. Like chilling. Yeah. And catching up on whatever I was like yeah. streaming on Netflix or whatever. That's um, probably hard too to like want to get out and do things when you you don't have that much time at home. Yeah. You really do have to. 
be intentional about how you spend, especially if you don't have a lot of time when you're home. You have to be very intentional about what you do with the time you do mm-hmm. have. And <laughs> something that definitely shifted in me when I when I turned 30 was like I uh I if if there's something that I need to do or that I want to do, or like this is mm-hmm. That's yeah. it. There's no this I'm not overthinking this. No debates. Yeah. Like this is my time. And mm-hmm. if you're gonna take the time, this is how much it's worth. Mm. And if you don't like that, then you can call somebody else. Mm. Uh because I I need breaks. My wife is uh an artist as well. Okay. And I'm very grateful to get to make music with her awesome. too. And that was like one of the first conversations we had when we first started dating. I was like, babe. I know we both love this and we both live for this, mm. but I need breaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I know we both can talk about music for hours, oh, yeah. but I also need to have conversations that don't have anything to do with music. Yeah. Like, and if you're okay with that, then we're going to be fine, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, but it's sometimes you got to be able to like turn that part of the brain off. Yeah. That way that when you come back to it, you're still like, you're recharged. Yeah. You still love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even just like it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, especially if you, I mean, I, I guess you're not really like working with your significant other, but like that could be a whole nother issue. Of like, oh, there's no escaping the <laughs> the music and the work. and the, Sure. Uh, but I, I guess I was curious about that too. It's like, um, to, you know, it's not really a, I want to say a rare thing, but I guess it's hard for musicians to really like, have significant others and stuff and i was wondering like what are some of the most compatible uh occupations for like musicians to like find a date i guess another musician's a pretty pretty like obvious one but yeah. i don't know if you've like dated around and kind of seen like what works what doesn't work i have only been in believe it or not three relationships mm. um i was in a, a short relationship in high school and she didn't do music but I mean, I was in high school. Yeah, I didn't even yeah, know what yeah. I was going to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then out of college, I was in another relationship and she was also a singer. Mm. Um, and we got along and we performed together. Mm. And then and we're still friends, even though it didn't work out between oh, us. Oh, that's good. And um, and then I met Sarah and I wasn't even like looking for my partner to be in music. Yeah, It just ended up being one of those situations um i don't know if you're a spiritual person but i sat i remember getting off of the road and i was sitting at a red light and it was the first time i'd ever prayed about Mm. just getting a sign of like this is the person i need to put my energy and time into because i was i was content with being single i was fine with it but i was also very much over it and i was Mm. i was just like friends with a lot of people Mm -hmm. and I was that person that, you know, if you needed to talk to somebody that would listen to you, I was that person. And, Mm. but I, yeah, that can be hard, you know? Yeah. And you carry a lot of that stuff with you sometimes too. And I was just at a point where I was like, just tell me, just give me a very clear sign. I am very stupid, I guess. Yeah. 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 Where I just like, I just need to know who I need to be more than just friends with. Yeah. And and I met Sarah at uh something told me to go to Sunday Night Soul at the five spot. I don't know if you've been. That's definitely something worth going to. It used mm-hmm. to be every second and fourth Sunday. Now it's only just the fourth Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, run by an incredible human being, a singer, songwriter named Jason Eskridge. Mm-hmm. And uh I had just gotten off the road and I knew I was in town for Sunday Night Soul and something told me to go. Even though I was I knew I was tired, but something told me to go. And I get there and uh, I ran into like a bunch of friends I hadn't seen in a long time, including a guitar player named Peter, who I went to Belmont with. And we were just catching up at the bar. And then somewhere along the lines in our, in our conversation, he was like, hey, man, while you're here, I'm glad you're here early. You get to hear this girl I'm playing for. Her name is Sarah. She's really good. Mm. And then pieces of her band start to walk up and I know them. It's like my buddy Derek <laughs> is Derek Phillips is playing drums for her, and Janelle Means was singing background for her. I was like, oh, this is. These are some of my favorite people, and they're all mm. as- associated with this girl that I don't know. And they were all saying the same thing. They were like, oh, you got to meet Sarah. Hopefully, y'all could do something together one day. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm here. 
Um, and then she walks up to the bar and she loves it when I tell this story because I, I tell it the same way every time uh, I saw her and then everything just kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. And it was like one of those like come to Jesus moments where I was like, okay, all right, I, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. And then they were like, you guys should, you know, exchange information or whatever. And I'm like, I'm still processing. <laughs> Everybody else is excited. I'm just like, all right, here's my, yep, here's my phone. <laughs> and hopefully the, the number you put in there is the right one and it's not 911 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and she was nervous because she hadn't performed in the R&B soul space yet. She'd been in Nashville for a year and a half up until that point. And all of her friends were like in the singer-songwriter country world, even though she is very much pop R and B. Um, so yeah, she does her set and I'm just at a loss for words. She does one song by herself and I go and stand next to her drummer and just like kind of fall mm. onto him. And he was like, bro, I told you. <laughs> and, um, and then she's finished and, uh, I go up to her and what I thought I said was, you did a great job. I'm pretty sure that's not <laughs> what I said at all. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I was like, cool. She just kind of laughed, and I was like, yeah, cool. I'll just go fuck myself and stand over here. <laughs> and then the rest of the guys in, in Dynamo started showing up because we were friends with the guy that was headlining. So I was like, at mm -hmm. least I'll be able to like hang the rest of the night and see some more old friends and hear some more good music. And um, But then there were moments where, like, during my friend Clinton's set, uh, where I would catch her sitting at the bar, like, smiling and laughing at me. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I didn't completely ruin it. Yeah. Or she just thinks I'm dumb. Yeah. Either way, she's yeah. still somewhat interested, I guess. So we talked for a long time after, just like about the fact that I was like, how did we not meet up until this point? Like, I've been hanging out in this world for a while. And also, just the fact that she was Danish and like how she got into that kind of music and whatnot. And, mm. um, so from that point on, we. I started inviting her to shows. I was like, these are people that would actually like like to meet you and these are good people to know and all that stuff. And Zach actually was like, bro, you got to like take her out on a date because <laughs> she clearly wants to like hang out with you and stuff. And mm -hmm. I was like, that just wasn't even part of my thought process. I was wow. just like, I just like being around you. But I'm like, oh, I guess I should ask you on a date. I just didn't yeah. do that. I didn't do it in college. I didn't really yeah. do it out of college. I just liked hanging out with people and if it went somewhere cool but if it didn't i was like well nashville's small i'll probably still see you around yeah. and the music industry is even smaller so yeah. um yeah we six years later here we are that's beautiful dude um that's beautiful. and we waited six months before we even made music together oh wow i wasn't in a rush to do that and i'm glad she wasn't either <laughs> yeah um, when we first that. started dating, everybody was so excited. They're like, oh, I can't wait to hear the stuff you guys do. I'm <laughs> like, y'all y'all are going to have to wait. You act like we got together so we could make a record or something. Like, yeah, no. I like this person. Yeah, I know. like doing life with this person. The fact that we do music is just the icing on the top. Yeah. Like, we can speak the same language. Um, and I can also learn a lot from her. Just just the Scandinavian approach to music is so mm. inspiring, oh, wow. especially with pop. Like, I wasn't already like fascinated really with pop from a production standpoint. I mean, I grew up listening to a lot of it and I didn't realize that most of what I was listening to was Swedish. Mm. You know, when you realize that Max Martin has done everything yeah. and is still doing everything, you're That's like, right. oh, this man is the goat. Yeah. And it's right next door to Denmark. So clearly everything in Scandinavia is, the quality is just a very top tier mm. level. And I didn't really understand how, High that level was until I watched her do rights on like Zoom during mm. COVID. Yeah. And she would show me the demos that were mm. being made in just a matter of like an hour. Mm. And it was like the vocals were like a voice memo that she just tracked into her phone or whatever and like emailed over. And yeah. I'm like, this is the dem this sounds like the master. Like this sounds like this already ready to be played on the radio. Like they just threw this together. Oh, wow. And I'm like, man, I thought you had to go to LA to get like <laughs> And in some ways you do yeah, to get right. pop, you know, but yeah. most of those guys came from Europe. I'm like, oh, you got to go to the source, <laughs> you know, with anything, yeah. which is what's cool about being an American and going there. Yeah. Because if you want authentic um, R&B or like certain specific realms of hip hop, you got to go to 
you got to go to me for that or yeah, right. you got to go to the Americans for that absolutely because that's where it started um but it's it's cool that it's it's very collaborative over there and it's very inspiring that like people are just like they'll eat they'll eat it up mm. um like I got to play a jam very similar to the Flamingo in Copenhagen I've played it a couple times oh, wow. the only difference is because it's still very improvisational but the difference is there's covers Mm. um okay and we sat in uh the first time we went went and played the Niles barkley uh crazy yeah i love that and i've played my fair share of weddings and corporate things in my day so i was like i'm not gonna play this like the record i'm just gonna have fun with this song but i'm not gonna do anything like crazy or mm. too complicated but yeah <laughs> i yeah i caught it as soon as i did <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny to like very like like in the smallest amount like reharm sections and see the guitar player on across <laughs> from me just like lose his mind like, Wait, <laughs> i've never heard anyone play this song like that or just like yeah. change a major chord to like a sus mm. or something and or just like make sections sound really gospel -y. yeah and because of that i ended up playing the rest of the night they were like oh you're american how long are you here? Like all these questions. Do you know this song? I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I know all of those songs. And I'm like, yeah. And like people just walk up. Do you know this song? I'm like, yeah, I know that song. <laughs> and, and the guy that runs it is a really sweet guy um, named Bobby. And uh, he's like, anytime you're in Copenhagen or just coming to Denmark in general, just like hit me up and you can be in the house band. We can figure out some stuff. You can do some stuff like during the weekends or whatever. Nice. And, so the last, the, the time after that that I went, I hit him up and I was in the house band for that jam and it was so much fun. Yeah. Uh, and it's so cool to be able to be somewhere on the other side of the world and like bring myself to the table mm -hmm. and realize how unique that is. Mm. Like no one plays like I do there. Mm, yeah. And the fact that I was like, oh, I could do a lot of work in a lot of different ways out here. Yeah. If I want to, you know, like that's the other beauty of being in Europe is there is a very clear separation of work and life mm. that I've been like very much holding on to whenever I come back. Mm. I'm like, oh, man, I like the fact that here. Just like um, introductory conversations are more like, what do you do? Right. Who, you know, yeah. versus like over there, it's like, who are you? Mm. You know, wow. which in a great way in, in a very subtle way is like huge. Yeah. Because you aren't defined by what you do. Wow. And in no way is that the case, but it is here. Yeah. And like I heard an interview with Waka Flocka, the believe it or not, and it was like you could go somewhere in new anywhere in the States and you're like kind of compartmentalized, like, oh, this is a black guy, this is a white guy, this is a Chinese guy, this is a Mexican guy. But if you go anywhere else, you're American. You know, right. And it's like, oh, because we all have a very unique perspective, just all being Americans. Yeah. And the only time you feel unified is when you're not in America. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's like that. Yeah. Oh, that mm -hmm. really caught me off. That really messed me up and caught me off guard. Um, but that's been a beauty of like being able to go over there and now have, you know, family over there and mm -hmm. be like. I can just go over here and like not be on my phone. Yeah. I can choose whether or not I want to like pay that whatever that small amount is to like text or use mm -hmm. data. Um, cause the first time I went out there, I went for a month and a half and I didn't do that. I didn't text. I, I didn't, you had to like communicate through like Instagram or, mm -hmm. and I had to be on the Wi-Fi to get it. Mm -hmm. And it was such a nice, like unplug oh, yeah. of just like my phone is now just a camera. Oh Yeah. You know, people know I'm all right because when I'm on the Wi-Fi, I'll like post some pictures on Facebook or something. I'll make a photo album of like, this is where this is where I am. This is what I did. Yeah. But outside of that, it was the first time I felt like I was like really living. Mm. Like, yeah, everything I was seeing, I was seeing for the first time and I got to really see it. I didn't have to see it through my phone or yeah. I didn't have to see it while also having to deal with someone texting about some gig yeah. that I couldn't make because I wasn't in the same country. Yeah. <laughs> that was like the fun, the, the most fun was like people who hit me up about stuff and me just like responding, not in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 
at least having trying to have the decency to be like, I'll try to find this person, especially if it's a person that I care about, like letting them know, oh, they probably don't know I'm not there. So I'll let them know that I'm not there. But then that's it. Yeah. And then like hitting my parents up, obviously. But yeah. 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 I went to France. I, had a, I have a friend, lifelong friend who has been living out there for a while and I got to stay in her apartment. And uh, it is, it's so much different. Like you go on the, on the tube and there's like all these different languages being spoken around mm-hmm. you. And it's just like, yeah, I guess you are just like <clears throat> an American and like, the, I guess all those countries are so close together. It's almost like the States. Yeah. Like when we're in America, it's like, Oh, you're from Louisiana. Yeah. Not like, Oh, like, like yeah. <laughs> that's, you know, six The perspective that we've also often forget is how big America is. Yeah. Right. Because when you compare America to like a lot of these countries, like Denmark has 6 million people. Yeah. There's 8 million people in New York city. <laughs> yeah. And then you wonder why things, people just don't get along over here. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah, yeah. We're trying, you're, you know, we're trying to please everyone. It's like, yeah. I'm like, damn, the more I think about it, how do we have a president? How has that worked <laughs> this long? Yeah. And it's kind of still not working. Because yeah. So how much, if you really just think about how much power he actually has yeah. and how many hoops he has to jump through just to get things to work for the people that he's trying to help, which is generally supposed to be everyone. Yeah. But, you know, everyone is bitching about something these days, but... It's so funny when you compare it. It's like, oh, well, you go to Denmark and everybody just is like, yeah, they, the government tells you to do that. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. Even if you don't want to get vaccinated, it's like you still, you're not mad that the government is like still making you get COVID tested. Yeah. Because they still care about people. Like, right. I wasn't even upset at the fact that I had to carry around like, like my vaccine shots yeah. and like my, you know, boosters and all that stuff when I had to go places. That's right. Because it's just like, yeah, because I care about the people that I'm around. I don't want to make anyone around me sick. It was also nice that, I mean, shots or uh, tests were free Mm. and just readily available. Yeah. And you only have to wait like 15 minutes. You don't have to wait a whole day of just like wondering if you're sick or. And then you get in your head and you give yourself like, you know, all sorts of like. Yeah, that was a crazy time, man. Yeah. That was crazy because, yeah, you feel horrible, like the guilt of like. Like, oh, and like really like in L- Louisiana, people were getting back to business much sooner than a lot of other places. And it's Same like Nashville. Man. Broadway didn't stop. Oh, <laughs> I believe it. I remember just like <laughs> driving around just to get out of the house. I would just like drive downtown and just around and I would still stay in my car. I wouldn't like park and go somewhere. I would mm-hmm. just drive downtown and then drive back home. And I would see people walking around. And I'm like, what in the hell is everybody doing? Yeah. Is there anybody watching the news? Like yeah, people yeah, are yeah. fucking dying right now. Yeah, yeah. But I was like, no, I'm gonna go get my beer and I'm gonna go to Tim Roof. I'm like, yeah. you could just go to the grocery store with a mask on and buy beer and take it home and do the yeah. same thing, you know? Yeah. But it was like the social environment that people just like had to have. And granted, during like the back half of COVID, the first like few virtual shows I played. Mm. Or like music videos I was able to be a part of where we were all like still doing the precautions of like getting tested and making sure everybody was okay. And that just being able to play with other people. I remember the first time I had a rehearsal, I think I cried. Because mm-hmm. not yeah. only did I miss these people, but I missed yeah. doing this with these people and yeah. being able to share these moments with these people. And I'm like, oh, we get to, we get to do this. And then that's the, that's the moment where you're like, oh, God, I can't take this for granted anymore. Because when it's taken from you, you're like, God. Yeah, that's true. What am I gonna do? <laughs> yeah, like you can play as many video games as you want, but like when you <laughs> when you love music and when you love playing it and sharing it with other people, ah, oh. oh, there's you can't describe how that feels to like have that taken from you, and then you get to like get a little bit of taste of everybody doing it with you, yeah. but like everybody's wearing a mask, and you're like, ah, oh. like when something starts to just sit. I remember the first that that, that first rehearsal, we just like fell into this groove and it just sat there for a while. Mm-hmm. And I just remember looking at everybody and just like crying. Yeah, like I was like, we don't we don't have to stop. Like we didn't even have to rehearse. Like I remember these songs, but I was just like, oh yeah, I I I really miss this and I miss y'all. Yeah, like. Of course, I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that we're doing it okay, that somebody yeah. doesn't get sick. Yeah. You know, because I don't want to go backwards. Yeah. I want to be able to get out of this 
so that we can do it somewhat normal again. Yeah. Yeah. Like the first, my welcome back to the real world in 2021 mm. was playing Lala. Mm. And that was the most people I've been around in a year. Yeah. And that was a guinea pig festival because it was like the first major festival that had contact tracing and you had to have wow. at least a shot mm. or you had to have at least a COVID test yeah. saying that you were negative to get in. And then I was like watching like Post Malone set or something. It was like 20,000 people just like standing in front of me. And I'm like still wearing a mask. Just like, I don't know if this is okay. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. This is also freaking me out. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, like anxiety was like high. Yeah. Well, it's all such a blur. I kind of forget oh. when the when the guilt left and when I, when the anxiety went away, I kind of forget the timeline on that. Cause it, Same. it, it, it was so long. And also like Louisiana was so like, you know, rebellious too. So it's kind of hard to tell like exactly how long things lasted. But I remember when I went to, to France, yeah, we had to have vax cards and we had mm-hmm. to do all that. But like, well, and I guess there was waves of it too, you know? Sure. So that I forget about all that too, but yeah, because yeah. the first time I went to Denmark, there was another shutdown because that was the height of Omicron, mm. and that was the end of 2021. Um, so like I saw, uh, was it the Spider Man No Way Home mm-hmm. while I was there? But it was the last day all the movie theaters were open, oh, so yeah. like everyone went and saw that movie at the same time. <laughs> and Sarah was with me, and she had like a she kind of freaked out because like, there's a lot of people in here, and we're all wearing masks. We're like trying to eat popcorn, and we're like, I don't, you know, you yeah. know, you just there was so much uncertainty, yeah. Um, but it was cool to be again in an environment where everybody was just like, okay, this is what we have to do now, yeah. Like, it's nice to know that you could still walk around outside and be okay for the most part. And if you don't feel okay, you could just go get a test and then get a tech, a text, um, and then it was. That's what was funny about going back the second time because it was within the same year. I mm-hmm, went right. like the week before Christmas and then stayed all of January and got back here in February. And then I went back in July. In July, it was like, oh, it was like nothing happened. It's yeah. Like, Everybody's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, after that second wave, I feel like you just was back to, <clears throat> back to full, full-blown. <laughs> but yeah, full-blown society, you know? It's like yeah. a lot of... There's only so much you can, there's only so much, so long you can not work and like yeah. so long you can uh, kind of be scared and just live life like that. It's yeah. kind of crazy. So, and when the music industry in particular hit its green light of like, all oh, right, where yeah. it go? Oh, yeah. You just have to just accept it. Oh, yeah. Cause I know touring out of COVID felt so weird in those first few months because it was like, it was nice to live day to day. And I had been so used to living month to month or like seeing things like far down the road. But then coming out of COVID, that stressed me out. I was like, oh, no, I have to. Okay, yeah, I guess we're doing that. Uh, But then we have to. Okay. And it almost was so overwhelming to like have a schedule. Yeah. And like, no, okay, these are the things that we're going to do. And then then we're going here and then we're going here. Like even just driving long distance Mm. felt so much worse (laughs) than it did when I was, I mean, that was also just like going from touring in my twenties to, Mm. to like late twenties slash early thirties and being in a van, not feeling the same way. Oh, wow. Um, and being like, we got to be a lot smarter about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, this is fun, and I love y'all, and I love this. But we can't, we... Got to be more comfortable. Yeah. Like, I didn't experience a bus for the first time until 2022. Mm. And that changed my life. Yeah. Like... You could lay down. Oh, <laughs> I got there and everybody was like, do you need anything? Do you need? I'm like, I'm fine. Got more than I need. I have more than enough. I, uh, I, I can plug my phone in next to me. I can just watch YouTube videos. There's a TV. Everybody was so nice. Oh, sick. I was like, yeah, I, I'm good. What run was that? What, uh, I got to do 10 days with Marin Morris hmm. 
And that was one of the first like country situations where it was like an it was a an automatic yes. Because she's incredible. I love her music and I know that her crowd isn't weird. Like they right. it's it's sad to have to think about an entire genre and be like, oh, I bet that pays well, but I don't feel safe taking that gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like I've I've had black friends mm. on big touring acts sure. oh, and wow. still have really awful experiences. Mm-hmm. Like I had a, my friend Mike Hicks toured a long time with Rascal Flats and mm. would get like pulled aside by security at an arena or something. I'm like, I'm the reason you have a job today. Right. I'm yeah. playing for the act that's you know, and having yeah. to constantly tell people and prove people that that's why you're there. Crazy. Just because of the act you're on. Yeah. I have another buddy that used to tour with like Florida Georgia Line. Mm-hmm. He's black and he's gay. And I was like, man, you don't even play for artists that like defend you publicly. Mm, yeah. They'll do it, you know, and to your face. Wow. Sometimes. But like Oh wow. I'm like, man, I don't I would hate that. Yeah. That's pretty that's gotta be artist specific, not so much genre like Sure. In, like, in some ways. I think I think yeah. It's hard because a lot of the women, especially that are saying the right things within country, are mm. all also trying to leave country because like Marin is getting more and more out of it, like because she could easily go more pop mm. and more like yeah. rock and more like churchy, bluesy, mm. you know, because she's done so many things that all honestly inspire country too, like just just from the history of country and what country is and what it comes from, all of those things are touching. It's just mm-hmm. country is such a historically backwards genre. Mm. Um, but I feel like all of the, the like Marins and the Casey's and like, and all the black women that are making huge leaps mm. and bounds in that genre. I feel like all of them are the ones where it's like, yeah, I'll play that gig. Mm. Um, because I also am fighting for you to win. Yeah. You know, like during COVID I was, not only playing with Devin, but I was playing with Joy a lot of coon and she's been killing it in that regard too. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wild to have to think about that stuff when you just want to say yes to something that's like probably going to be fun. Yeah. And then the shows are probably going to be fun and the, the, the pay is probably going to be great. But yeah, going back, like that was the first, like, Oh yeah, I would absolutely do that. That would be so much fun. And, I I made myself very proud in all of the preparation for that because that was the first, like I would say, like really big um, situation that I'd ever really been offered, mm. um, and I didn't have a lot of prep time. But I think even looking back, the prep time I had was probably more than some people get, mm. given that I didn't have rehearsals with them because they toured, they, they rehearsed for months before that tour started and this was me coming in halfway through the tour because the main keys guy had gotten let go um and uh i was also grateful to have earlier that year like when we started tracking devin's record um i had reconnected with marin's md uh this guy incredible piano player named david cook who lives in new york uh he also mds for taylor swift oh wow and um we met in new york because uh, his wife is also an artist named Shayna Steele. And we went to his wife's album release at Rockwood when Dynamo had some time off in New York. Um, so I, we, we got to all hang out. And then this was like six years down the road. It was like He was reconnecting with me. He called me. I was like, hey, man, would love to like add you to the list of keyboard players I can call when I'm like, because he has to like put bands together and like we'll MD those and remotely. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, of course, if you call, this is worth it, you know? Yeah. And um, so that happens. And then he reaches out like at the beginning of the year about um, <laughs> just seeing if I had anything going on in the fall. And I was like, well, I have dates with Devin between September and October. And he's like, okay, well, I'll just, you know, keep throwing paint at the wall and see what sticks. I was like, okay. And then um, Marin's one of her guitarists who also plays Ox Keys, uh, Eric, called. He's like, hey, man, I know we've been meaning to get you know, a a drink and some food at some point to hang out. But are you free this month? This was like right when I got back from Denmark. I landed in top of August. He was like, are you free this month? I was like, yeah, I I don't have anything going on. He's like, you want to play some shows with us? I was like, I would be honored 
to do that. Yeah. And then David Cook calls me again. He's like, hey, I thought you said you weren't free in the fall. I was like, you didn't say anything about August. I'm I'm free. He's like, okay. And then he just sent me a zip file of all the songs, all the charts, and, and the board tapes of one of her shows. I think it's in, in Cincinnati. So I put all the board tapes in Logic and was just practicing to that for three days. Um, and it was nice to like read nice detailed charts for the first mm. time in a while because I'm so used to just writing number charts for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it was so nice to have detailed charts, especially for songs where I had to like learn things mm. off of the record. They yeah. were note for note. Mm. Um, how how were they detailed? Like not sheet music, but like uh, detailed in the sense that they were sheet music. Oh, it was sheet music. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So there were like sections where like um, there would be notation. I'm like, oh, I need to play this note for note yeah um and then also like in the chart it would say when i would start playing or when i would come in or when it was just marin or mm -hmm. when it was just guitar or when it was wow. all that stuff was in there which was wow. great um <clears throat> and then yeah i i got the music on like a wednesday night i was in the house band for flamingo so i didn't get to see any of it until like that thursday thursday friday and saturday i didn't leave my studio i was just running the, the set over and over again, learning the songs. And then by Sunday, I had another gig uh, that I had to like relearn some songs and, and then learn a new song for um, for my friend Allie. And it was a nice like walk away because when I was able to come back to the songs, I could see how much I remembered. Mm. So by Monday, I was like being able to run through the songs without using charts, which was my goal. Yeah. Was to like okay, I know what my role is in these songs. I also know the songs because I was just driving around listening to them. And then my first show was that that next Thursday, that coming Thursday, mm -hmm. uh, flew to Salt Lake City, and my rehearsal was sound check. Yeah, and I was very proud of myself being able to show up. And we had all the time we needed to be able to run everything, so we ran Sweet. the whole set. And there was a point where we were like going through all the songs and they turned around and were like, are you using charts? Are you using anything? I was like, I didn't even want you to know I was here. You know, I wanted it to be so seamless that yeah. if you say anything, that means I'm doing something wrong. But if you don't say anything, that just means everything's fine. It's a great attitude. Um, also because they had done a few shows where all the keys were in the tracks. Um, cause mm -hmm. they couldn't have a sub or find a sub for mm -hmm. those. Um, so I felt very good about the fact that all I was really using was like a, a little cheat sheet that I made of the set and then mm -hmm. all the keys mm -hmm. and like what I was playing on each song. Because I was going bef between a Nord stage three that mm -hmm. was going through like main stage mm -hmm. uh, and it would change to each, each patch as the song was being counted off by the click and all that stuff. Um, an organ and a vintage vibe roads mm. and uh so there were like certain songs that started some places and there were certain songs that were all organ uh then there were certain songs that were just roads <clears throat> a bulk of it was a lot of organ um but then the stuff that was on the grand stage it was like you're cueing actual things from the record so like those are the things that you really don't want to get wrong especially like her song like 80s mercedes starts with piano and it's like all right you gotta that's all on you. And yeah. it was cool to be able to talk about those kinds of moments with Dave. I'm so grateful for for him being so like available mm -hmm. leading up to these shows because wow. uh he's done so much as as a musician and as an MD in his career alone. Just like talking about like moments and sets on big gigs where it's like you start the song and if you mess that up, that's on you. Mm. So just like having the mental capacity to realize how important certain things are and being able to go into those situations, not nervous, but just like more of a, just be aware that you cue this, you count this off. Things are cued in the click track, but just, just be ready. Yeah. Just, just, you know, and I, yeah, I did a good job. Um, and everybody is so sweet. I still like talk to everybody on Instagram and whatnot. And, and Marin was really sweet. And I remember making sure to tell her how, 
honored and just like grateful and happy I was to be there and in an environment that was very welcoming. Yeah. You know, being like even like previously stated, so standoffish about taking stuff yeah. in this world yeah. and to be so welcomed, you know, and 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 relaxed and comfortable. Yeah. Wow. In a situation there, I was like, ah, oh, this is this is great. Oh, it's a slice and of if, heaven. And if it works out, then great. And if it doesn't, because it didn't, uh, they they hired. Mm-hmm. They actually ended up hiring. Uh, they kept it in house. The the guy um, Jeff that was Keys Tech and mm-hmm. laid back and all that. Mm-hmm. They ended up hiring him to be the guy mm-hmm. to play Keys. Um, and I was actually happy for him because he was great. And we were hanging out a lot while we were on the road together. And nice. So I was like, I wasn't upset. I was like, wow. I made new friends and I had the experience and now I know what that level can feel like. And I know that I'm ready for it. Yeah. If it, if it, you know, if it comes up down the road again, um, that was such a, that was such an experience and the money that I made paid for the engagement ring and the wedding bands and the organ that I bought for that gig. Cause I didn't have an organ and Mm. the, the keys guy that had that gig for a while, he had a real B3 and a Leslie, and wow. they were like, you just have to bring an organ. I was like, well, I don't have a good one. The only yeah. one I had was the uh, Vox Continental, mm. which for what I needed to know, or what, what I knew I was going to need to do, I needed something with real draw bars and felt like an organ and all that. So mm. I got an XK5 from Corner Music and knew that I was just going to make it back, you know. Um and uh, it was very full circle, actually, because so I did that run in August. And then in September and October, I had a run with Devin. We were touring with Lake Street Dive. And uh, before that run, Sarah and I went and looked at rings. Um, <clears throat> and then she went to the bath. She basically picked her ring. Yeah. And... And then we looked at running bands and we found one that complimented her engagement ring and I found something that I liked. And then she went to the bathroom and then we started the process, me and the guy that was showing us around. Yeah. And uh, it worked out timing wise that like I was able to do everything online when I left, and, like put a deposit down and get everything sized and made. Uh, and I was like, if everything works the way I hope it does, when I get off this tour, I'll be able to get home and get the rings because I planned it around me getting back right before her birthday. Um, so her last, sh- our last show was in Oakland. Um, and we flew back through Houston. And when I got to Houston, I got a text that said that the rings were ready. And then she picked me up from the airport that night. It was like Oakland to Houston to Nashville. It was like a Friday night, Saturday morning. I went and got the rings and on the way there, I picked, I FaceTimed, her parents in Denmark on Facebook, just like letting them know, hey, guess what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was it was awesome. And then her birthday was Monday. I proposed to her that morning in the house. I got us some coffee. Oh, and um, and then uh, yeah, we got engaged. And then uh, the funny thing was like we you know shared it to the world or whatever yeah. and then david cook calls me he was like hey man congrats on getting engaged i was like oh thanks man yeah it's like you remember those uh those dates i didn't i told you you didn't have to keep open i was like are they still open i was like well which which ones he's like can you play red rocks wednesday oh. i was like uh oh. babe oh. can i play red rocks <laughs> wednesday yeah and she was like yeah i was like oh god i got a good one i got a good one but I was like, the only way I can do it is if I fly out Wednesday morning because I already had agreed to doing a music video with Devin on Tuesday. Wow. He was like, and in my in the back of my mind, I'm like, also that gives me a day to like relearn all of these songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but that was a hell of a week. It was like Monday we got engaged. Oh. Wednesday I played Red Rocks. And then Friday I played this place called the Armory in Minneapolis, which is where the original Lakers used to play. Wow. Um and then drove back with them in the bus to Nashville. That's that's I got back that Saturday, and they all got to meet her because they hadn't met her yet um, in person. So 
that was a special week. Oh yeah. And it was very full circle because when I got there, when I got to Denver, they were like, "We heard you got engaged." I was like, "We got engaged." This was a team effort. One of these <laughs> yeah, things yeah, would yeah. not have happened as as smooth as it did. Wow. Without the other, wow. you know, like so, it was just awesome that everybody was like so happy, and I was like, I was still just like so grateful. And I'm like, well, August, if August hadn't have been the way that it was, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Yeah, you know, wow, dude. Um, so that was definitely one of those moments of just like the clearest full circle moment of like, ah. Oh, yeah, that's I guess that's just how that was supposed to go. <laughs> Dude, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. Uh man, I really appreciate you coming, man. Uh sounds like I don't know, some roofers are here or something. Oh my god. But dude, I mean this is this has been some great perspective, great talk, man. I I really appreciate you coming here. Is there anything like you got a message for the people? Anything? Mm. Yeah, a good a good uh sender home. Hmm. Do what makes you happy. I feel like we're living in a time where there are a lot of a lot of opinions about what you should or shouldn't do with regard to like your dreams and like your art. And I feel like the less like noise there is, the more you can just fully enjoy doing what you want to do. And then, like, kind of the living that happens in the midst of it, too. Like, I feel like the the as soon as I was able to stop, like, either compare, comparing myself to, like, stuff that I was, like, inspired by and, like, realizing, well, I just want to be the best version of myself that I want to be. I think that was the moment where I, like, really started to um, have things just, things just, you know, started to happen the way that they were supposed to happen. Like I, I think I was able to allow them to happen the way that I wanted them to, or in, in, in some way, I guess. Yeah. Um, I feel like when you put a lot of less, a lot less pressure on yourself and on the thing that you do, you're able to enjoy it a lot more because at the end of the day, we, we, we do what we do because it makes us happy. Yeah. And if you get to a point where it's not making you happy anymore, something has to change. Because you don't want to completely give up on, you know, the thing that makes you happy. So if something has to change that's that's keeping you from being happy, then catch it <laughs> before you're just, like, burnt out. Because I've had a lot of friends who were very good uh, get burnt out and don't play music anymore. And that is one of the saddest things, I think, to watch happen. Especially when you know that the person you're seeing get burnt out is is very good and was very happy um mm -hmm. so i think you know being able to just like find the things that make you happy within this industry um and and holding on to them and like fighting for them one last thing yeah uh did you ever have like a little side job other than music or has music always been kind of your your main income it's I yeah, I'm very grateful that it's it's been it's been everything since I graduated college. The thing that I didn't say was um I originally went into college doing science. Hmm. Uh I was kind of early on when I was when I was really young, I was put on the path of uh, the seed was planted of like, Oh, you could be a doctor and then my pediatrician said it as well he was like oh you could work at my office and you could be a doctor you can go to school and do all these things and you can work for me I'm like, oh that'd be cool and doctors make a lot of money yeah but i and then i went i i volunteered <clears throat> at a hospital for, for five years did a lot of shadow work and shadowing and, and and saw a lot of incredible things and helped a lot of incredible people and met a lot of incredible people um, and then I went into Belmont with a radiology major that kind of like was a partnership with Vandy. It was a physics degree in, in partnership with wow. Vanderbilt where I would have been at Belmont three years and then started work study like senior year at Vanderbilt. And that first year of college was, it was cool because I mean, the stuff we did was cool, but I wasn't happy. Mm. And that was the first moment where I realized 
that I at least needed to at least give it a shot because I was a music minor. Um, I should give back. I should give backstory. I growing up, I always wanted to help people, and it didn't really matter what way that that needed to be. Yeah. I just assumed that being a doctor was the way to do that. Yeah. Um, but there was always a moment that I had in my back pocket, and I'm glad I had it. Um, while I was working at the hospital, there was a piano in the grand entrance, and when I would go on break, I would go play the piano. Mm. And it was the first time I'd ever seen people experience music and also experience like a shift in their lives just yeah. because there was the presence of music. Mm. Um, so I would play and I would see people walk in and I'm like, you're going to a hospital for two things, something good or something bad. And I don't know what those things are for you, but it's cool for me to see that what I'm doing is affecting you in a positive way. Yeah. So that was the first time I'd ever really seen music act as medicine yeah. and act as something that is helpful outside of being a doctor. So I always kind of held on to that and was like, okay, so if going to school to be a doctor doesn't work, then that, then I should at least try. Yeah. Because, you know, there's all sorts of special things that happen with music with regard to like, uh, mental health and just like the experiments that have happened with people with, with Al uh, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. um, and them hearing music and remembering everything that they did or wore or saw when they heard that song the first oh. time. And so that has always been a thing that's been like a kind of a driving force of just staying on this, this path, this crazy path <laughs> I've been on. Yeah. That's always been like, I would say like one of the seeds that's just kind of blossomed into what life is now um, because it started at such polar opposites, like to go into school with the thought of being a doctor and then to come out and be doing this. Um, and luckily, like my parents were very supportive. I was, I was scared to do that transition. Um, but I was also lucky to already be in a music school and just have to re-audition and change my major to mm -hmm. music. And it's not like I had to like come back home. I was still in Nashville. Yeah. I did there things could have been a lot harder, things could have been a lot worse. Yeah. I'm just very grateful for how things have played out so far. It's amazing. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Wow, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right on, man. Bye everybody.